2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 begins this way. Paul says, But as for you, Timothy, be clear-headed in every situation. Stay calm and cool and steady. How many of you know you need to be steady? Which means to be faithful, to be persistent, not to be unwavering. He said, fulfill the duties of your calling or your ministry. What he was saying is, Timothy, don't back up, don't go sideways, but stay steady in what God has called you to do. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and at the time of my departure from this world is at hand, and I will soon go free. And then he says here, now, by the way, he just announced that his days are numbered. He is on his way to Rome. He sees what's about to happen to him personally. And this is what he says to Timothy in verse 7. He says, I have fought the good and worthy and noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the victor's crown of righteousness. For being right with God and doing right, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that great day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved and longed for and welcomed his appearing. I'm reading out of the Amplified Version, by the way. And then he makes this statement out of nowhere. He is talking about the end of his own personal days and, and, and giving an exhortation to Timothy on how to be faithful, to be steady, to continue on. And then he hits Timothy with this, with this statement. He said, make every effort to come to me soon for Demas, having loved the pleasures of this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Paul is writing this letter to, to a spiritual son about another spiritual son. He makes a very dramatic statement about his future. It's emotional time for Paul. He knows his days are coming to an end. And he has a spiritual son that is by his side ministering and traveling with him. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have been faithful to the assignment that God has given me. And he said, the time of my departure from this world is at hand. What he was saying is, I will soon become a martyr. I will soon spill my blood for the gospel. At the end of this letter, out of nowhere, he says, Demas, this man Demas has deserted me. How many of you know that the church world today is full of deserters? Amen. Ones who have walked away from their destiny, from their calling, from their purpose. And have subsequently become casualties of war. Now, just so you'll know that a casualty is not one who just perishes on the battlefield. In the military definition, they look at a casualty as anyone who is either perished or paralyzed and unable to fight. That is a casualty. So if you get maimed on the battlefield and you're unable to fight, you are considered a casualty. You understand? Just so we're all on the same page here. I have seen personally in my life too far many amazing people, far too many amazing people, I should say, that were so in love with God, they, had, they, they showed a pattern where they were so engaged with the things of God, they were active in the church, they were, they were being used of God, they, and, and then suddenly something happens and they turn their back on God, walk away from the church, walk away from their purpose, walk away from their assignment, and then they vanish. They become what I would call missing in action. They, look, they enlisted <laughs> into the army of God when they became a Christian. They were at one time fighting the good fight of faith just like Paul was, serving God. And then something happened. They became disengaged or disenchanted. They became disconnected with faith. Possibly, maybe there was a tragedy, maybe there was a sickness, maybe they got offended, maybe someone in church hurt them. Something happened, or maybe it was just a, something of the world, of their past life that they could not let go of. And they went AWOL, which means absent, without official leave. Demas was a spiritual son of Paul. 
And we know by Scripture that Demas was a companion of Paul who traveled with him in the ministry. What I would say, he was a disciple in training. He was, a, he was a maybe perhaps a young apostle in training. And together, Paul and Demas labored together. They endured various different kinds of trials and troubles and, and persecutions. And they worked at extending the kingdom of God. But something must have happened to Demas while on the mission field. We never, we never find out what become of Demas after he went back to Thessalonica. But we know that Demas never started out as a deserter. Because if you go back and look, and even in Acts chapter 15, Paul makes a statement and he says, I will not take John Mark with me because he's been proven to be unfaithful. So we know that Paul had a standard that he had established in the ministry where he was very careful on the people that he took with him. So we know that if Demas was with him, we know that he must have began strong. We know that he must have been in good standing with God, that if there was something that, that Paul saw in Demas, and Demas was growing, he was becoming a spiritual son, but then boom, something happens here in the book of Timothy. And so now... Paul is facing a crisis situation. The young son and the Lord that he loved and poured into and imparted into, who was a young man in training, has now deserted him. Which his name is very befitting for his character because Demas in Greek means a man governed by the emotions or a man governed by the flesh or by the passions. So we know that Demas's character got the best of him, the Demas character. But we don't know what happened. We don't know what crept into his heart and mind. All we know that he abandoned Paul on the mission field. <laughs> it's one thing to, to, you know, to do it at night when they're off of the journey, but out in the middle of the assignment, he abandons him. Could have waited until they got done. And said, look, Paul, this is what I'm feeling. This is why I'm struggling. But no, he walks away in the middle of the assignment. Now, we don't know what happened to Demas. I mean, other than the fact that Paul said, having loved this present world. That means a lot of things. But here's a couple different examples of, of possibly what could have gone on in his mind. Maybe he got discouraged because he realized that a lot of Christians that he was around maybe weren't weren't walking the walk, or maybe they, they weren't cracked up to what they were claiming to be, and maybe he got disillusioned or discouraged. Maybe he got disappointed <clears throat> at the failures and the inconsistencies. Maybe he started idolizing Paul, which can really get you in trouble. You start idolizing a man, you lose your adoration for God. So maybe that he lost his, his, his affection for Jesus because he was just amazed at how wonderful Paul was doing on the mission field. Maybe he was looking around instead of looking up. Maybe perhaps he was struggling with a certain sin that caused him to become critical, not only in his own life, but in those around him. Maybe there was something in the world that got a hold of him. Maybe he forgot his dependence on the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Maybe he had just gotten disappointed that he had not grown at the rapid rate that he believed he should have. You know how many people get discouraged and give up because they're not growing as fast as they think they should? Now, what, what would happen in medical terms if you saw a baby born and within three months they were 12 years old? How crazy that would look, right? It's like, how do you explain that in the medical profession? It's, an, it's abnormal to grow like that. People that grow quickly in the physical end up with all kinds of aches and pains because it's a, you see what I'm saying? So sometimes you have to grow at the pace God's given you. Are you here? So we don't know what happened to Demas, but he did start well. But the thing to remember in, in our walk with God is it doesn't matter where we start. What matters is where we finish. Have you, ever, have you ever saw a race of where the spotlight is put on the gate? No, it's always on the finish line. Everybody can start running, but not everyone can make it to the finish line. Are you here today? Spiritual defectors will be part of 
every church that exists. It, it happens. And sometimes it even happens to pastors. You know that I, I read a statistic recently that up to 1,500 to 2,000 pastors in America each month are leaving the ministry. That's a lot of shepherds that are abandoning the pastures. A lot of shepherds are saying, look, forget this stuff. It's not worth it. And they're giving up on their assignment. But it is a cycle that has been repeated over and over and over and probably will continue to until either the Lord returns or the church wakes up and breaks that stronghold because it is a stronghold. Amen. Now, Paul said, and I'm, just, I'm teaching for a moment before we go where we really need to go, so just bear with me for a few moments as I build some foundation. We know because of Scripture that Paul said Demas went back to Thessalonica. So what did he do in Thessalonica? The Bible's unclear. We do know some things about Thessalonica, that it was a very prosperous city that had been infiltrated with lots of economic trade. It was a population of about 200,000 people in that region in that time. And it was, it, was a, it was a people where if you were in business or if you wanted to trade, it was a place of where you can prosper. But along with that, Thessalonica was also known as a land of vices. So more than likely, just as they prospered, they probably had every vice of the flesh that you can think of. So it's befitting that a man governed by vices would end up there. It was the perfect place to go for Demas. But Paul makes a statement. He says, Demas deserted me. Now, you know that word desert, desertion means an act of leaving a military service or duty without authorization. It means to abandon or defect from our duties as a soldier of Jesus Christ. And I love what he, what he wrote in 2 Timothy 2. He said, be strong, endure like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He said, no soldier in active service, listen to this, <laughs> gets entangled in the ordinary business affairs of civilian life. He avoids them so that he may please the one who enlisted him to serve. Ever wondered why a military base is separate from the community? That reason right there. It's to keep the soldiers focused on their command. Every base, when you look at military, and I'm not a militarist or anything like that, but when I've studied a lot of when you look at every single base in America, they have a command. There's a specific military command that that base represents if they should get called up for service. You see what I'm saying? So he says, endure like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that when you got saved, you entered into an army of the Lord? Amen. You, nowhere is there a poster in heaven that says when you become born again, you become a freeloader. You became a pew stinker, a pew warmer, whatever you want to call it. Or you, you become lazy and, and, and have given authorization to just feed off the state and not do anything. Nothing like that. When you and I become a Christian, we become born again. We are now into the service of the Lord. Now, I came across an article this week that was just intriguing. But our government years ago uh, solicited a... a a commission among a lot of uh, psychiatrists and a lot of doctors in different fields, along uh, politicians, lawyers. There's a lot of people that were part of this group. Uh, they brought in people from that designed their their weaponry. They 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 brought in people that that designed their clothing, uh, that studied warfare and different things. And their mission was to have this group of people study and do research and present to the Pentagon a finding of coming to, to understand what are the characteristics of a deserter. Now, if you go back and you look at, at the, the first Iraqi uh, uh, Gulf War, the, the, when you talk to an American soldier, and I had family that were there, it was amazing that they said, look, here we are ready to fight. All of a sudden, we see this sea of hundreds of thousands of Iraqi soldiers laying down their arms and defecting. He said, all the money that we spent and all the mobilization putting five, 600,000 troops over there was wasted. It was the five-day war or whatever it was. We just bombed them and, and they gave up by the masses. They defected. So 
But the interesting thing was, is you would not believe the number of U.S. soldiers throughout our history have defected from our own military. So the Pentagon was interested in finding out, look, in our enlisting process, in our recruiting process, is there, is there traits that we can look for, maybe that we can avoid bringing them into service if they have a tendency to defect? You see what I'm saying? And so here was the finding. I'm just going to read this quickly. They came up with nine major reasons of why someone defects in military in a, in a time of, of war or in a, just in a time of service to, uh, to a military. Number one, which this is in order of, of, of rank. Number one, the number one reason of why people defect, you ready for this? Weakness of character. Number one reason of why a soldier will lay down his arm and abandon his post and abandon his command and, and totally walk away, which is illegal in the government's eyes. You desert, you can be court-martialed and hung. You certainly will get course marshaled and imprisoned. They don't necessarily hang or shoot anymore, but you'll serve life in prison for deserting on the battlefield. They, most militaries are like that. Number one was a weakness of character. Number two, lack of loyalty. Number three, cowardice. Number four, criminal motives. Number five, Substance abuse. They said that if you enter into the military with an addiction, chances are it will drive you to the point of desertion because you're not going to have access to that sort of stuff. So the desertion level is high among people who have drug and alcohol problems. Number six, mental deficiency or mental weakness. Number seven, illness. Number eight, Lack of, dis of, of discipline. And the ninth one, interesting, is homesickness, which they had in parentheses, world sickness. What they were saying is that, that they get, not that their home may have been great, but they get, they, they get lonely for the world that they came out of, their environment, their surroundings. I mean, it's an example, if you take a, if you take a Texas boy from a ranch uh, out of the middle of nowhere and you put him in a military in a big city of urban warfare, he's going to be out of his element. You see, that's what the point they were saying. When you pull them out of, if they lived in a cold climate, and you put them into a desert command and they're, they're going to be out of their element. But they said that is the ninth reason of why people desert. They go back to the world that they were most comfortable with. Now, if those are nine examples of what causes someone to desert a military command, is it possible that these are the same tendencies from a spiritual perspective of why God's people defect from his command? Are you here? Don't get quiet on me now. See, as a pastor, the worst thing that to go through is when someone leaves the church. I mean, it's awful. It's an awful feeling. It really is. <laughs> and, and it's funny, though, that, that we have learned that, that a calling isn't dependent upon whether people come and go. And ministry doesn't stop when people come and go. The calling is still there. The ministry, the voice of that ministry still has to continue. Am I right? It's funny, though, that we have been told over the years, I'm going to throw out a couple examples uh, since we've been in ministry, um, we've heard all different kinds of reasons of why people leave church. I was told personally one time that, look, we didn't come back because you didn't have a bingo club. Well, I didn't know that bingo was important. I'm nothing wrong with bingo. I'm just saying I didn't know that was important in the gospel. But, but seriously, I was told that, look, you didn't have a bingo club, and that's what we were looking for, so we found one down the street. I thought, okay, I guess I'll talk to God about that, and maybe, maybe it's somewhere I can find in Scripture that there, it's important to have a bingo club. And we've been told that, that uh, you know, we didn't have a big enough children's ministry or we didn't have all the games and programs and, and uh, you know, the worship was too long. And, and it, it's, it's, it's bizarre today how people shop for churches like they shop for groceries. And sometimes they can't even articulate with words why they're leaving. Sometimes they don't even know why they're leaving. They just have this mindset that says wander off, become a sojourner. Become a, a, a tribesman that have no home, no covering. See what I'm saying? Sometimes people leave because of offense, resentment, jealousy, envy, 
Sometimes they leave because of pride. Hmm. But despite all the different reasons and excuses that people give, you want to know the underground reason of why they become prone to leave. Because they stop encountering God. Some, somehow, either they've shut the voice of God down, they've shut the word of God down, or maybe they were in a dead church, who knows. But somehow they are no longer engaging into an encounter with God. And it's interesting that even in the presence and power, now listen to this, even in the presence of a move of God, people desert. I remember hearing Bill Johnson, who's a man of God in Bethel, got invited to go back to Bethel Church, but to pastor his dad's church that had planted there in Reading. They had 2,000 people in their church. And they, uh, his dad had passed on. They invited him to come. And he said, look, I'm going to come with two requirements. One, that you accept revival. And two, you accept the mess that comes with it. So they unanimously voted him to become pastor. And he said, look, I was born for revival, so we're going to have a move of God. Six months, a thousand people left the church. And everybody was with their mouths open, like, what's going on here? You said we're going to be in revival, and we've lost half of our church. A thousand defections in the midst of God moving. I, it's just, I, I can see when it's dead. I can see when, you, you know, when, you, when you're in a church of the frozen chosen and, and, and the pastor doesn't want to move in God. I can, you know, I can see all that. But in the middle of a revival, you want to move out from the moving of God? I don't understand that. that, that I can't comprehend that stuff. But even under the leadership of Paul, Demas deserted. Even under Jesus how could you travel with Jesus three and a half years and do what you did to Jesus like Judas? How, how is that possible? Judas would have been an example of a deserter. Now, I can, I, now, this is not written, but I'm just my own opinion on this. I see this. I thought, yeah, I could probably see that. Had there been another club, had there been another religious camp moving in the same time of Jesus and the disciples, he probably would have went to the alternative. I, I'm sure Gehenna hanging himself wasn't his first idea. We know he went back to Sanhedrin, so maybe he tried to go back and get into that camp and got rejected. Ended up in Gehenna, hanging from a tree. But something there is, here's the point I'm trying to make. There is something that is common in the nature of a deserter. And I want to, and I'm going to talk for this for a moment. By the way, I just, I gave you my opening. That was my opening announcement. So now I'm going to give you the word. <laughs> Amen. I wanted to, I wanted to build some framework so you'll know where I'm, where we're going this morning. Even under the leadership of Demas and Jesus, that we see defection and desertion. Believers today go from church to church to church, and really sometimes they don't even have a heart, uh, or uh, they, don't even, they don't even know why they're bouncing from place to place. They just, they've not been able to connect. They, I, I've had people tell me one time that, look, I don't want to be responsible. I literally told me that over coffee. I just came out of a very controlling church. This was their excuse. I just came out of a very controlling church. I understand that. I was part of that as well. I saw how, how pharaohs can control people and, 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 and keep people in slavery. I understand all that. But I said, it doesn't matter if you were in that mess. God still wants you covered. He still wants you protected. I can't be a part of any church. I just go from church to church to church. And I said, you're not going to ever be blessed because nowhere in Scripture is there a calling to be a sojourner. Are you here? So here is possibly three different reasons as to why desertion formed in the heart of Demas. Now, I'm going to talk to you for a few moments, and then we're going to deal with a stronghold at, at the backside of this. Here are three common reasons of why people, if, if, if the underlying belly of of desertion lies, spiritually speaking, with people not encountering God anymore. I'm going to give you three reasons as to why, right? Number one, a deserter will initially begin rejecting conviction. When conviction is taken off of the life, when conviction is, is, is removed from the hearing of the Spirit of God, then it's only a matter of time before either one, they self-destruct, or two, they desert. 
First Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 1, this is what Paul wrote. He said, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, we know that he has chosen you for our good news regarding salvation came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with great conviction. He didn't say great condemnation. He said great conviction. He said, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your benefit. So deserters will close their ears to conviction and they'll blame it on condemnation. And have you ever noticed that people that don't want to be convicted will not only stay away from God, but they'll stay away from you. They'll stay away from people who do want to be convicted of the Spirit of God. Now, let me make a statement because I came across something that just rattled me this week. I, thought, I can't believe people, pastors, are saying things like that. But I heard a statement that the Holy Ghost doesn't convict. And, and then the statement was, don't feel guilty about your sin. I'm thinking, my God, what have we become? Now, there's a difference between convicting as in rendering guilty, like a convict becomes convicted at trial, and then the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Y'all understand what conviction is, right? Y'all understand that the Spirit of God, his, one of his missions is to present you and I blameless, without spot or wrinkle, before the Father, before the bridegroom. For what purpose? Why do you think we have the fruit of the Spirit? Amen. To cleanse us and to create in us an atmosphere of where we are growing in the fruit of holiness, right? How do we do that? Well, by allowing the Spirit of God to bring a conviction over us to say, look, what you're doing is grieving to God. It is, it is against the will of God, or it's, it's, it's not in the Word of God. Stay away from that. See, some people can care less about grieving the Holy Spirit. Really. Some people, man, they just forge on, continue on what they're doing, regardless. And then, here's the sad thing is, is that, that oftentimes, They'll, they'll come under conviction, or maybe it's a message that gets preached from the pulpit. And then they'll run out and say, man, I can't believe I got condemned. That's a condemning church. That preacher is condemning. He's, he's bringing a message like repent. That's a condemning message. We, we, I've saw people leave because of that. <laughs> I mean, the very first word of the gospel of the kingdom was repent. And people say, I don't know, man, you get too, you get too legalistic. Legalistic? God says, if you want me, turn from your sin. That's not legalistic. That's an invitation to God. Amen. Hallelujah. But oftentimes they'll use the, 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 I felt condemned. And what they're mistaking is they're really probably under conviction. Now, there is a spirit of condemnation that can come from a pulpit. Man, when you're getting beat up week after week and, and it's killing hope, that's condemnation. I've been under that too. That's a lethal killer, man. Because it takes you away from freedom. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. So when conviction's there, what happens is that they mistake that for condemnation, and then they start walking in guilt and shame instead of hope and liberty. Amen. If you're under guilt and shame, that's not God. Right. That's a spirit, all right, but it's not a spirit of the, it's not the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. You see what I'm saying? That's a spirit of condemnation trying to wreck your hope in God's freedom and God's power and God's love. Amen. See, and conviction is a wonderful thing because it's goodness. There, there's something good in conviction. Because you know why? It leads you to repentance. Amen. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Amen. Thank God for that. Now, the second thing, if I can continue on in teacher mode for a moment, is counsel. Interesting thing in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place to test you, that is, to test the quality of your faith, as though something strange or unusual were happening to you. Have you ever felt like that before? God, I don't know why I'm being feeling like this or why things just don't look normal, but my faith is being ripped in every direction. That's why, that's why Peter said, don't think it's strange. You are in the schooling of faith. Every attack, oftentimes, is, is that schooling. What are you going to do with that attack? What are you going to do with that temptation? Amen? But he says in verse 13, But in as so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, he says, keep on rejoicing. Amen. So that when his glory filled, now listen to this, when his glory filled with his radiance and splendor is revealed, you may rejoice with great joy. 
He said, if you are insulted and reviled for bearing the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God is resting on you and indwelling in you. See, it, counsel, and this is important because I'm more than likely Paul probably had many conversations with Demas trying to counsel Demas. How could you travel with a man like Paul knowing that that everywhere he went, he turned the city upside down. He, he, he was persecuted, had rocks thrown at him. He was, he was jailed. He was beaten up and whipped. He was lowered out of a window with a basket trying to hide from the persecutors. I, that, to me, when you have that kind of a resume and you go up on the door and say, look, I want to travel with you, you better know that that's something that you're going to probably see and encounter. More than likely, Paul said, look, Timothy, you're going to go with me. Just understand, I stir up devils. I come against the, the religious system. He said, I, I'm going to be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted with me because you're guilty by association now. He said, when they come against me, I've, I've been in jail with Silas, my last spiritual son. He said, we've threatened to, to be executed. I was last time in, I took a ship. I got shipwrecked. I got bit by a snake that tried to kill me. <laughs> Welcome to the ministry. Young Demas, look what, look, isn't that exciting? To be hoping for the glory of God and to see the glory of God and have to deal with that. That's persecution, friend. We don't know what persecution is here in the nation. That's persecution. And I'm sure that he had the conversation with Demas saying, look, Demas, you need to be aware. This is what could happen. So if you're going to travel with me, this is how you handle that, right? Makes sense. I remember, have you ever heard of Charles Finney? He was an old-time revivalist, part of the Great Awakening. Funny, I, I read a book one time from him, and he, he said he used to have a team of horses. He said, the devil couldn't get to me, so he got to my team of horses. And this is a man that would go into communities up in the northern England, New England states and revival, man. It was the, one of the first great awakenings for America, religiously speaking. Churches were born everywhere, revival. It was amazing outpouring. And he, every young uh, son that he would take with him in the ministry training, he would always warn him, look, when you get in this carriage, we've got a five-hour trip to the next town. He said, the demons can't get after me, but what they'll do is possess my horses. And I've had them run me off the road, run me into a ravine, just get all crazy and bust up the carriage and try to attack me while I'm in the carriage. They've, they've ran off with the wheels and just put me into the dirt. He said, all of these things were an attempt by these demons to come after me. He said, so just know that when you get in this carriage with me, you're going to see that. And one spiritual son was saying, man, it wasn't 30 minutes. We got into this ride. These horses went berserk. And he's being bounced all over the carriage. And, and Charles Finney is there smiling and saying, I told you, these devils are crazy. He said, we've even tried replacing entire horse teams. But God taught him that, look, the devils, they can't come after you. They can't stop your assignment. But they're going to try to stop you from getting to that assignment, which I'll come back to in a moment. So the third one is accountability. Why is accountability important? Because the Bible requires it. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they will watch out for your souls and those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. A Christian cannot be accountable if they desert those that will keep them accountable. <laughs> Some deserters will hide from accountability by drifting from church to church. As if they're hiding from man, they're not hiding from God. Right? But accountability is protection. It is covering. Some, unfortunately, just don't want to be corrected. Did you know without accountability, guess what a believer ends up forming? Itching ears. They will begin to run to people that will agree with them, that will establish an agreement with them. And really, it's just a lack of wanting to be accountable. They will look for opinions that agree with what they're dealing with. Even Paul, in the book of Galatia, chapter 1, brought a stinging rebuke to the church of Galatia. He said, I, he said, I'm bewildered and puzzled and irritated, he said, that you were so quickly to shift your allegiance and desert Jesus for some strange doctrine. Paul was, again, trying to hold the church in Galatia accountable. 
Look, you believed in God. He founded you, (laughs) your young church, and now you're deserting him for some strange gospel. See, here's the point that I want to make, and then we're going to move on to the stronghold. Demas, the end result wasn't how he began, unfortunately. It was how he ended up. Whether or not Demas went to the church at Thessalonica, whether he was ever restored, the Bible does not say. But one thing that the Bible does say is that he abandoned his assignment. His purpose was left unfinished. It was never completed. See, accountability to some represent having to grow. (laughs) Some people don't want to grow. They want to stay babies forever. I I wish I could stay a baby forever. Man, you got all those easy things, you know what I mean? Taken care of, never have to never have a care in the world except eating, going to sleep, and going to the bathroom, I guess. And playing whenever you want to. What a life to live. But we were designed to grow. Some people don't want to be held accountable for growing. They want to stay with the milk bottles. Hey, bet. Hallelujah. Many have the mindset... Oh, here's I'm gonna I'm gonna dig a little bit, so stay with me. When there's a lack of accountability, believers tend to stop at salvation. In, in other words, salvation becomes their destination. Salvation is not our destination. Heaven's our destination, but we have an assignment once we get saved. Amen. And we are not to stop soon as we get born again, see. And many have the mindset that salvation is enough, that there's nothing beyond that. Oh, we'll press and believe for salvation, but we're afraid to talk about life after salvation. See, conversations are great, positive, uplifting when we're talking at the dinner table after church about the goodness of, of God. But when, it, when someone mentions the commission, man, everything, the lips go silent. Because people are afraid to talk about what they're doing for the kingdom or the lack thereof. And people don't want to bring up conversations that may convict they're doing nothing. See? And so they stop at their assignment. I would probably have to say, by and large, the majority of what we see in the church are probably stopping at salvation and not fulfilling their assignment. When you're saved without fulfilling an assignment, guess what you are? You are saved, but virtually frustrated. You are frustrated, and you don't even know why sometimes you get frustrated. And the first thing that you want to do if you get frustrated is blame someone. Well, it's their fault that I'm not busy. No, it's not. It's your fault you're not busy. Now, don't get quiet on me now. <laughs> hmm. Assignment. For some, seems to no longer have value or priority in people's lives. Now, you know, people attend churches today for many different reasons. Um, some attend church because it's the place that they were raised in. Some attend church because it was the church where grandpa cooked the, the brisket every month. Some attend church because it was a church where mom and dad dedicated a cornerstone. Some people uh, go to church because they're looking for a man or they're looking for a wife. <laughs> Amen. Or they're looking for a friend. But many times we don't consider our assignment. Amen. Are we in church because of our assignment? And this is why I want to take a moment and talk about the spirit, the stronghold of the deserter. The devil did not stop Demas from being a missionary. The devil stopped the assignment that would come. Demas became another casualty on the battlefield. It was never God's plan. But God didn't want to stop. See, he couldn't stop Paul. Paul was was moving on. Demas, on the other hand, God thought, look, or the devil thought, if I can stop Demas, maybe I can stop Paul. And if I can stop Paul, maybe I could stop the assignment that God wants in Rome. See. The assignment wasn't in Demas. The assignment was going to be in Rome. See, there was a purpose for him traveling with Paul. There was a purpose, a ministry assignment to him 
to be at the apostle's side. Do you understand? The spirit of the deserter is a devil who's after your assignment. It is a territorial spirit, a stronghold. Paul was journeying to Rome, which was being controlled at that time by a major principality. Are you hearing this? It was ruling over the city. And who knows, Demas could have been God's man so that when Paul left this earth, that anointing could have fell upon Demas like it fell on Elisha. And who knows, God's assignment could have been that, look, the church at Rome lost its, its father in the faith, but God was planning a new man, a young man that would carry on the work. Who knows what could have happened in Rome if Demas would have stayed at Paul's side. See, it was the assignment that was under attack. And the enemy was using. He could have had a double portion of Paul. Who knows? You and I today could be reading from 1st, 2nd, 3rd Demas. There could have been a book in the New Testament authored by Demas. You could have saw his name mentioned multiple times. A man moved in miracles, raised the dead, planted churches all around Italy. Who knows what you could have read had this man stayed to his assignment. Do you know how many, do you know how many books right now that have not been written? And the author are in the graves. Do you know how many worship songs to bring God's people into the glory have not been written? Because the person supposed to be writing them is probably sitting in a bar stool somewhere backslidden. You see what I'm saying? All of those gifts, all of those treasures, all of those assignments have become incomplete or incomplete assignments because people desert their calling, or their purpose. The word assignment means duty. It means appointed position. It means commission or purpose. Every single one of you in this house has been given an assignment. Every child of God is given an assignment. What do you do in the kingdom of God? I just go to church. What for? What do you do in church when you're there? What do you do when church is over? What, how do you live your life the rest of the week? What assignment are you living in? See, the assignments, that, look, there's assignments that we have inside the house, assignments that we have outside the house. What is our assignment? What are we doing inside the house, outside the house? First Chronicles 9, 23 says, So they and their children were in charge of the gates and of the house of the Lord, the house of the tabernacle, by assignment. He even said they and their children. Even the children have assignments. Amen. So we have to remember that when we desert our post, we're not deserting a pastor or a, a church. We're deserting our assignment. As I said, for some, salvation is enough. For some, they don't want to go any further. They just want to be good church folk. How many of you ever met just good church folk? Man, some of the best people in our society have been good, trained church folk. The best people in our, in our society are good church folk because they take the principles of, of what is taught, they live them, and they become good assets for society. They may not be people of God's assignment, but they're just attributing to a goodness in society. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but what's funny is not it people, how people can live a life of addictions in the world, and when they get saved, they get addicted to church. You know, there's people addicted to church. They're not addicted to God. They're just addicted to church. They've exchanged one high to another. And I, man, I've, we've had some. We, we've met some over the years that will come in, and it's like they're an addict looking to get injected with a high. They, they, want, they want someone, or they want a preacher or a song leader, someone to, to release something into the atmosphere that stimulates their emotions, that makes them feel good. Now, we've seen it. Houston's full of party spirits in church. We, we used to, I can't believe I'm saying this stuff, but we used to do a night watch service on New Year's Eve, and then we had a, a pack came in one night, one New Year's Eve, and said, look, we're just going to church to church. We're church hopping. I said, what do you mean, like, like bar hopping on New Year's like you used to? Oh, yeah, yeah, same thing. we just going to church to church on New Year's Eve, getting the fix. I thought, my God. I said, so I asked them one, and they never came back. I said, so let me ask you a question. Are you addicted to the high, or are you addicted to Jesus? Do you come to church to get injected or do you come to church to get transformed? And see, 
the, the, the stronghold with that is that they, they, they come in looking for a drug that numbs the hellacious situation at home. And it's like, my God, my life is so miserable. I'm so dramatically messed up that I need my fix every Sunday to get a good word, to get a good feeling so that it can carry me through the week. Well, what about Sunday night? What about Monday morning? What about Tuesday afternoon? What about Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? And what happens is, is that when we get addicted to that type of nature, we totally obliterate our assignment. I, but I'm here this morning because I've got good news for this. Uh, if, if, look, if we can't change in here, how are we ever going to change out there in a society? How are we ever going to change the city of Houston if we can't change ourselves? See, And I know that we're not a people that it's after the high. Hey, it feels good when God shows up. It feels good when God moves. It's the best feeling on earth. But what if you were put in a jail cell like Paul was? What if you were facing a shipwreck like Paul did? See, the, the, the dynamic changes dramatically when, when, when we face that kind of thing. Amen. But my good news is, is that there's a new breed coming. There's a new breed God's raising up today. There's a new breed of believers, a new army of God's people that don't want to be entertained. They want to be edified. Ah, are you here today? They don't want to have a temporary fix, but they want an eternal and eternal solution. Ah, glory to God. See, we're not a church that, that is after the latest dress and fashion of the church. We want to be clothed with righteousness. And we're not after the next sugar high, but we're after to be seated in heavenly places. Glory to God. Hallelujah. See, we don't need our lives to be filled with the power of some man's opinion. We need our lives filled with the power of God. Amen. <laughs> A new breed of, of God warriors that he's rising up. He's raising up a people that will get up in the morning and instead of grabbing the, their pot of coffee, their first thing that they'll grab is the Bible and they'll look at that devil and say, Devil, today the war is on. You want a battle? I'm ready for the battle. I don't even need my cup of joe to induce me to feel good. Go, nothing wrong with coffee now, so don't think the pastor's preaching against coffee. I love Starbucks. God bless them. But a new breed that's not afraid to get in the devil's face and say the war is on. Mm, 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 mm. Why? Because we refuse to coexist with a principality that rules over our assignment. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, The weapons of our warfare are not physical, but they are mighty weapons, divinely powered weapons for the destruction of fortresses, to bring down strongholds. Now, let me take a moment and, and give you some understanding about this stronghold of desertion. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present age, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly supernatural places. Did you know that some cities have certain strongholds. You can go into some cities and you can pick up, if you're a praying believer and a discerning believer, and you'll pick up certain strongholds over certain parts of the country. There are some cities that are equal of size. There are some cities that, that they're overrun with the sex trade, like Houston, everywhere. There are some cities that don't have to battle that. They don't have, that's not their issue. But you go on Friday nights and the bars are full because alcoholism is a stronghold there. You see what I'm saying? Some cities like Washington, D.C., if you ever go through there, you talk about a city that is, that is greed and power hungry. You can feel it in the air. Everybody wants power there. That's a stronghold over the city, as beautiful it is. Every city has a ruler, a principality that is hovering over the, the environment, trying to control, trying to stop the credibility, and the evidence of God. Did you know that there are still Sodom and Gomorrahs all over the world today? May not be named Sodom and Gomorrah, but the stronghold is there. See, listen, just because those cities perished didn't mean the stronghold perished. See, that is still a stronghold today. See, some areas have greater influence than that. But if you remember... When Jesus went to the, the tomb of the Gadarene, you remember this story, when the demoniac came out 
And Jesus was getting ready to cast the devil out of the Gadarene. You know what this man said? He, out of his voice, it was the devil speaking, but this is what it said. Have you come, Jesus, to torment us before our time? And Jesus asked him a question, and there was a reason. you got to be careful when Jesus asks questions. Because that one question defined the environment. And I'm going to give you this, this, this nugget here. He said, who are you? This, they said, we are legion, which means we are regimented. We are structured. We are organized. We are, we are, we are framed together with a purpose. The purpose wasn't to possess the Gadarene. The purpose was to possess the Gadarene land. And, they, and this is why they argue, well, look, don't cast us out of the territory. Cast us into a bunch of bacon. <laughs> and so the Bible says he suffered him so. And the, they, left, they left the young man and entered into a herd of swine. But their argument to Jesus was, don't cast us out of our assignment. Don't cast us out of our territory. Why? Because we are legion. We are regimented. Hallelujah. And if you cast us out of the region, we no longer have territorial rights. Now, you know, now listen, here's the reason. See, you'll never find devils fighting and arguing with each other. When's the last time you read about a devil attacking another devil? You don't see principalities warring against principalities. You only see that in the church. First church of this can't get agree with second church of that. Pastor's in an offense with this pastor. This believer has, has went to 12 different churches in the land because they've offended 12 different people and they can't get free. And so the only fighting and the quarreling that we see is in the local church. You don't even find that in the demon world. But their problem was is that, look, we, we've, we've, we've possessed this man, but we cannot leave the, the territory. And see, when they said we are legion, it defined their assignment. See, that's why you've got to understand that the devil has a highly operational, organized attack set against you. They're not disorganized. They're not chaotic. When they come, they come to you in order. They march together in a spirit of unity. You can't get unity in the local church with 12 people. But in the demon world, they march in a spirit of unity. So the assignment, now if you listen, here's the interesting thing. Remember, um, in the story in Acts chapter 8, uh, just a story that comes to my mind. That it's interesting that in, in Acts chapter 8, there the Philip who went down to Samaria. If you recall, that wasn't the first time the gospel went to Samaria. Jesus went there with the well, Right? Okay, so if we're, if we're talking about a stronghold, if we're talking about an individual like Demas, one who deserted, the thing to remember is that the devil is after the one. It, 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 see, the devil wants to stop the assignment. And he knows that if we stay connected, if we stay faithful, if we stay engaged in the things of God, if we surround ourselves with other soldiers in the faith, hallelujah, then we become stronger in number and thereby more dangerous against the kingdom of darkness. But see, the devil sees what you carry. He sees what you're anointed with. He sees what you're equipped with. He sees what your assignment is. And if he can pluck out one, he can weaken the entire ship. He can weaken the entire movement. So the devil will set his sight on the one. Because if he can just get the one deserted, then he can desert or cause a disengagement with everyone that you would have touched. And so he, he goes after the assignment, right? All right, now the story here. See, he sees in you that you're a mountain mover. You're a giant slayer. He sees the anointing that God's people carry, the purpose that we carry, right? He sees what we walk in, and he's afraid of your assignment. He's not afraid of a, of a, of a monster church of 20,000 people. He's afraid of one who has an assignment. Doesn't matter if you have a church of 500, 50, 50,000. He's not intimidated by the numbers. He's intimidated by the assignment. 
See, he's afraid of that one that will not give up, not back up, not move or back down. He's afraid of the one that will blast the liar with God's fire. He's not afraid of the masses. He's afraid of the one. And that's why when he sees you and hears you coming, he'll send out legions to stop you. So this story, let me get on this because I don't want to veer from this because I'm going to wrap it up with this. In this story in Acts chapter 8, we just saw Demas who deserted Paul on his way to Rome, right? That's an example of what happens when, when assignment does not get complete. But can I show you what happens when assignment gets completed? In Acts chapter 8, if you recall, Paul was talking about the story of Philip. Philip went down, the Bible says, to Samaria. Samaria was the exact same place that Jesus went, showed up at the well. The woman of the well came out. She got a drink of water, but then she really got a drink of water. Jesus stayed two days, according to the scripture, and revival broke out. The entire area and region of Samaria came to know Jesus. That was the beginning, but it was not the ending. Jesus had to move on, the Bible said. But interesting that days, months, maybe years after Jesus went there, the man who would complete the assignment showed up in Acts chapter 8 by the name of Philip. Man. Philip went there to finish what Jesus had started. And it's funny that, that what happens with Philip when he gets there. See, Samaria, by the way, was a stronghold city. Even when Jesus was there, the woman comes out. She's been married five times. So you know what kind of stronghold's there. Interesting that the people of Samaria believed in God, but from the time of Jesus to the time of Philip arriving, guess what happened? They lost their affection of Jesus and put their affection on a man named Simon. Who Simon operated in a dual anointing because not only was he in the flesh, but he was being moved on by a territorial spirit that did not want to let Samaria go. So the Bible says that he was a sorcerer and that he moved in all kinds of, of weird, crazy stuff. And the people considered him a great man. Isn't that crazy? He was the spiritual leader, but really he was the voice of the stronghold that was controlling Samaria. It was a stronghold that was working to prevent God's assignment. And what was God's assignment? To complete what Jesus started. So here's what happens. The Bible says that Philip went down to Samaria and preached the gospel with power. And guess what happened? He started casting out devils. He started healing the sick. The lame began to walk. The chains began to fall off. And there was a freedom and a liberty. And then the Bible says, and joy broke out over the city. And here comes Simon saying, look, I, I was trying to do all this. And I couldn't get the job done. And Philip didn't even acknowledge it, but continued on. And guess what the Bible said? Until Simon believed. Simon, the sorcerer, gets saved. Gets born again, and a celebration breaks out. See, there has to be a joy over every assignment. Come on, there has to be joy over this city. Amen. It may not look, it may not look like a celebration right now, but it's time to celebrate. It may look in you know in your life that some things may be man that, that that's rough plowing there. That looks like it's going to be a challenge, but you know what? It's still time to celebrate. It may be rough believing in today's crazy world, but it's still a time to celebrate. It's time to carry great joy because you carry a great assignment. Like Demas, Philip was on the assignment. Demas never made it to the finish line. Philip completed his assignment and became an evangelist that the record shows that was a powerful, he was like Stephen, he was a powerful, mighty man of God because he did not back up. He did not back away. He did not take a detour, but he followed his assignment to the finish line. See, if we as God's people will stay faithful to our assignment, we'll stay faithful to the race. The moment we lose our assignment is the moment we ran off the track. We've ran off the rails. The moment where everything becomes blurry, becomes confused, and looks impossible. Tell the person next day, I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to back down. 
I'm going to complete my assignment right along next to you. Amen. This does not matter who gets there first. What matters is that we all get there. Stand upon your feet, beloved.